informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed attract and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss S you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. Okay, all right, that sounds exciting. Uh, let's see, what are we doing? Not that, not that, not that. Okay, well, I guess we're not doing anything. Uh, I tell you, staying in the house for like three weeks is a little bit much. We got another month ahead of us. All right, so what's going on? So the market's up about 2.5%. That's good. We don't we don't want to be up too fast. I said I think we talked about this, right? We want this. This is the kind of thing we want. What they say is like an L-shaped recovery. We do not want a V-shaped recovery because this was all bullshit. We needed to fill in slowly and come back to that 3,000 line. Come back to the 200-day moving average. It'll be lower though. It'll be it'll be about 2850. I think things are going to settle down about 2850 in about two months is the most likely thing. Unless the Fed over unless there's overstimulus or unless something breaks through on the virus. But the way I see it, I think sometime around June, July, we should be somewhere around 2850, and that should become the midpoint again. And we'll drift around that within about 10% of 2850. And that's going to be our range for the rest of the year which is fine, that would be nice, pleasant, and deserved. This was all nonsense, you know, or more accurately on the longer term chart, this was all nonsense. All this crap above 3,000 was just stupid. It never should have happened. You know, this is, this is fine. 3,000 being a floor going across, thinking about 3,000, trying to get to 3,000, that's your range. And you see it's, it's, you know, basically 200 points up and down. It's 2850 is over here. 2650 is a low, or 2600 is a low, and could it be 280 points, right? So 2600 is a low, and um, and uh, whatever, 20 about 3100 should be the top, and that's fine. That's a that's a perfectly fine range for the S and P. This is stupid. So when this dropped to here, it almost wasn't a thing. All that was was this bubble bursting finally. This is the virus. The stuff from from twenty from twenty eight fifty down is the virus. And here's your how much economic damage have we done? Is it lasting? It's not going to be lasting damage. And you know, and I was writing today. I mean, there's incredible, crazy speculation uh, uh, from from everybody. I mean, I I can't believe how many opinions people can have. I really don't. I, it's just amazing to me. In fact, oh, that that's one thing I want to look at. So look at. You know, this is just, you know, I, I, you know me, I do this all, all day and all night, I'm reading, but, um, see, that's the thing, I, I, I can adapt to anything, because I could care less as long as I can do my reading. As long as I have an iPad connected to the internet, I'm fine, because <laughs> given, given any time, free time, to, where there's nothing else to do, I'm going to start reading again. Um, so what's to say? All right. Uh, second wave of pandemic cuts later this year. Most ad executives. So now, you know, so it's very hard on the internet to differentiate who knows what the hell they're talking about, right? So ad executives project a second wave. Who cares? Although I, and then you say, well, Phil, why do you put these articles up? And don't forget, I, for, for every 10 articles I read, I put one up in chat to say, I think this is something worth reading. Um, 
sometimes something is worth reading though and people should remember this in the chat room is sometimes something is worth reading uh because it's stupid or because it's uh, a, a very different viewpoint than i hold that i think is still arguable i don't always put up only things i agree with but i put up things i think are you know make sense no not make sense I, I i put up articles that i think are worth reading whether good bad or indifferent i think they're worth reading i put up the stupidest things from fox news sometimes just because this is the stupid crap fox news is writing at the moment um so world trade organization and again these I, and these are supposed to be the big big experts but you know i i i know these people i've been used to hang out with them and they're they're not that smart they're, they they make stupid plays in poker and they um and they and they share dopey cat pictures and things like that they're not that much smarter than you are and don't be taken in by these people <laughs> I remember we were at the I was at the Buttonwood conference and I was sitting next to uh Mervyn King, who was the um the what do you call him? Um he was the head of the bank, the Bank of England, um, whatever, the, the like the Fed, like the head of the Fed. I forgot they call him the governor of the banking of England. So he's sitting on my left and uh, Joe Steele is on my right. And these guys were lecturing on economics at the Buttonwood conference. It's a gathering we have in New York. And um <laughs> And, and Joe Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winning economist. And we were just sitting there the whole time, like three kids making fun of them um, <laughs> during the conference. So, you know, it, it's it's humorous. And, the, and, and of course, the people who were speaking were like the world's top economists giving their little speeches. And we were just writing notes to each other, like how dumb they were, and whatever, passing notes back and forth and laughing with each other. So, you know, the bottom line is like experts disagree with each other. The experts aren't really smarter than you. Maybe they studied the issue more than you did, but they might not reach the right conclusion if they study it. Just like there's, you know, they seem to trot out these climate scientists who think that global warming is man-made or whatever their, their issue is, or, or think that global warming doesn't exist. Even though you see the planet melting, you can take pictures of it melting in front of you. Um, you know, they're, they're, somebody being in a position of, of expertise or somebody being interviewed on TV doesn't make them any smarter than you. And and be careful, especially in times of crisis when there's uncertainty. You tend to, and I, I don't mean you, you know, not you specifically, because I'm not quoting anyone specifically. But people tend to just sort of, you know, they grasp at straws. They're they're looking for guidance. They want somebody to be the expert. So everybody latches on to Dr. Fauci now. Is now, ooh, Dr. Fauci, he knows everything. It's like I don't know that he knows everything. He seems to have a pretty good handle on stuff, and I'm when I and I like him. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm just saying he doesn't definitely know everything. He doesn't know every answer, you know. But but he knows a lot more than Donald Trump, so he's a superstar next to him. But you know, he's not necessarily the best guy in the world to handle this stuff. Um, you know, he he's he's the best guy they have, that's for sure. But there may be better people, but that's the funny thing in the crisis. They don't look for better people, do they? They get the, they take the best, they take a person in the department that they have and make him the person. But that's not necessarily getting the best person in the world. The best person in the world is probably working for Pfizer. You know, they're probably getting a million dollars a year to study, to study drugs and drugs over at Pfizer. They're not necessarily sitting there doing press conferences every day, standing next to the president and kissing his ass. But you know what? I, that's the guy you should get. Um, and and it's weird. I was just thinking about this because I was talking to um. I was talking to somebody about uh, you know it's Passover tonight, and um. And we said, well, you know, people can't get together. And I said, well, you know what? We have this thing in Delray Beach where where, um, once once a year we have a restaurant week, and the highlight of restaurant week is a big charity dinner. And the whole one mile avenue of the town, all up and down the avenue, we have a table. We can make a giant table all up and down. And not, and not, it's, I mean, it's a crappy table, but they put, you know, they, they make it nice with tablecloths and all that. And so you have this really nice, and everybody in town dresses up and goes to dinner and sits at the table that's the entire length of the town. It's that thousand, two thousand people sitting at this table. Um, and we do that. And all the restaurants serve you. Then all the restaurants in town chip in and, and make the meals and serve you. And, and different sections, you, you, whatever restaurant you're near, you get served by that restaurant. Um, it's cool. It's a fun event. But and I, I was saying to somebody said, hey, we could do that, except that you know everybody has to be a couple of chairs apart from everybody else, and everybody can sit down and we could have a big giant Passover seder. 
And, um, and then we got into a whole discussion about whether that would be valid. And, I, and we were talking about social distancing and so on and so forth. And I realized that while we're talking about it, I'm like, nobody really gets up there and explains anything. How many press conferences has Trump had and Fauci had where they sit there, they get in front of you, but they don't explain why you're social distancing or how it works or what the purpose of what we're doing is. And don't you think people would feel better if you said to them, this is how a virus spreads. If you deny the virus access to fresh hosts, you will cut down, it will start dying out. And like, like a brush fire denied fuel. It's like, you know, you deny, you deny the virus host to, to infect and it will eventually, it, it will cease to exist in, in most places. Um, then the next round, if it comes again, it might infect fewer people. And also each person who's infected theoretically becomes resistant and creates a breaker wall that we don't have right now because nobody's resistant. But if people are resistant, there's a breaker wall that stops it, which is why the flu dies out after the first round usually, because a certain percentage of people are affected and those people then become resistant. And then if you can't infect those people twice, it's uh, harder to spread the second time. Um, Today, it's up because the Democrats are saying we need another $250 billion. Um, we do because, as I mentioned last week in the chat room, we're not allocating enough money to the bit to actual businesses. I, I had this chart that showed the allocations, and very, very little money is actually going to small businesses. Uh, and that's and that's a pro and I said that was a flaw in their plan last week, and now they're addressing it by doubling the size. Um, but even so, it shouldn't be hard. And the reason we're getting all these layoffs that we shouldn't get because there is a bridge loan that you can take as a small business that if you use 75% of the money to pay salaries for two months during the virus shutdown, you will be forgiven that money in the loan. So you get to pay your employees for free in the bounds of these loans. That's great. Sounds great. But you know what? Nobody could get the freaking loan. And businesses were hanging on and hanging on and hanging on because they were told that was what was going to happen. But then when in practice last week and, and this week when they start trying to get the loan, they can't get it. They're suddenly now all running around laying off their employees because they're saying, well, I, we thought there was going to be money, but now there's not. And, and you have to lay off your employees. You don't have the money to pay them. If you're a business and you got shut down and there's no money coming in, you have to stop leaving the cash. You have to basically, the problem, that's where trickle-down economics does work, right? Because the problem trickles down to your employees. It's like, I don't have any money, so you don't have any money. Goodbye. And, and then you've got obviously people who are, are very sick and are going to be still in recovery and people who are going to be still quarantined and people who are actually going to die. Um, all these things are going to affect everything else. You know, and, that, and then you've got grieving families and, the, and, the war, and then you've got people who are dealing with crushing debts, bankruptcies. There's going to be lawsuits. There's going to be all kinds of messy things going on. Um, I think the only people, I think lawyers are making good money right now, actually, because everybody's freaking out about this stuff. So what was I saying? Oh, experts. <laughs> <laughs> Try to stay on topic, Phil. All right, experts. So, as I said, reading the news. So, you know, I, the it's hard to tell. I mean, especially, unfortunately, you don't see the sources. I wish it came out better, but it doesn't. Um, when you get the article, can you see it? Nah. I, I have no control over this. This is just the way they come out. Um, 
and I don't mean no control, like like I couldn't, I can't tell the programmer it can't be fixed because it comes mostly comes from a thing called Flipboard. And when they I send over the information, only a little bit comes out. Um, so this is what we what we get. If we don't do this, it becomes incredibly messy because they're not consistent with the way they do it. So we we have all these filters to find the article headline and find who it's by, and find um, and find a picture if there's a valid picture, but it does it can really get who the source is. I would like to see the source here. It'll be easier if you knew who was saying it before having to click on it. I mean, I'll try it. I'm going to ask if that can be done. Um, so anyway, oh, actually, oh, I'm sorry. You know what? If you do this though, if you mouse over it, like my computer down here shows you um, too far of a trip. See there on the bottom left, it shows um, who who the article's from. I find that important because to me it's like I you, you get to know who you what news sources are good and bad. So anyway, Mnuchin, small businesses don't worry about relief. That's what we were just talking about. Uh, Germany's uh, got a fix for the model that was interesting. Um, uh, that's just sciencey interesting. Um, uh, teen spending way down. That's interesting. But here, see now you might read this, and this is from uh, Yahoo. You might read this and say, oh, oh that's te that's terrible, blah, blah, blah. But I read that and say, uh-uh, it's the lowest since 2011. It's not the lowest ever. It's the lowest since 2011. Again, and this is my my, ba my main premise for, for buying at this level is I'm saying we're not at a level that's never been heard of before. We're not in the Great Depression. We are at a level that existed, you know, uh, 10 years, not even 10 years ago, well, nine years ago. We were at a level that existed nine years ago, and that wasn't even the bottom of the bottom. That wasn't even the 2008, 2009 bottom. You know, so again, it just goes back to the, the, the simple rule of thumb is if you can pay less than 10 times earnings for a company and you don't see that that company is gonna be permanently impacted by the virus, that's probably a good deal. That's the easiest way to think about it. I mean, any company historically, if the P is 10, unless it's cyclical, cyclical may be a little bit lower, but a non-cyclical company that's got a PE in the range of around 10 is probably worth owning. And especially in this rate environment, 10 is 10% interest. If you have a 10 times PE, that means they're making 10% back on your money. The money's going back into the stock, but still it increases the stock's value over time. It's not being paid out to you like a bank note, but it does go, it does come back to you in some form. So I read those thinking about the total impact. And when I see that it's the lowest since 2011, I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. We can come back from that. Um, Pelosi and Schumer, we were just talking about. Um, Iran gambles, uh, who cares? Uh, I, well, I mean, it's in, I, I'm interested in watching what other countries are doing. Uh, the producers are still at odds. That's important if you're betting on oil, which we'll talk about also. Um, this Trump thing, that's horrifying. I mean, is that the Times or something, right? Oh, no, that was a real story. Oh, I don't even want to think about it. Um, McDonald's, the one notable major corporation is doing a course. So if I see something like that, I'm going to mention it. Um, uh, this is a real story, too. <laughs> They're watching him. <laughs> um, I like that. That was, that was fun. I used those pictures just in chat. Um, simple new methods make graphing. This is, I, I think graphing is really exciting stuff. I wish there was an easy way to invest in it. Americans are increasingly alarmed about the economy. This this is how long it takes. It takes until April 8th for Americans to become increasingly alarmed about the economy. Yet they have to be shut in for a month before they say, say, I'm worried about the economy. It just shows you how behind people are. But then it's funny because we always complain about like how the general market investors are so far behind us in figuring things out. And meanwhile, the average, the average American, which as George Collins said, it's like, imagine how dumb the average American is, and then realize half of them are even dumber. Um, it's it's just horrifying that it takes until April 8th for it to show up in a poll where somebody goes, hmm, you know, people are concerned. And now, and also the same thing. Now, finally, a majority of Americans disapprove of Trump's handling of the crisis. It's like after sitting on your ass for a month, a, a light bulb comes on the, and a Fox viewer's house, and he goes, hmm, I wonder whose fault this is. Um, and, and Colbert is, oh, that was funny, actually, because Colbert is sick of, uh, he's just pissed at this point. Um, 
and I'm pissed too. And I and I'm sorry. I agree with Stephen Colbert. It's like I talk to people who know what they're doing. We we're in a problem. This is a problem of our own devising. We caused this problem. The virus didn't cause this problem. Our response to the virus caused this problem. Okay, a virus is a thing. You know, if you have um, if you have uh, solar flares and they tell you to um, turn off your electronics, you know, for whatever, to protect your electronics, or if the sun is very strong, they say, don't spend too much time in the sun without cover. And people go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put on some sunscreen and put on a hat. You know, not you know, if you live in a place like Florida, you get to listen to those things. Um, so it's not the, the it's not the sun that you blame for being too strong today. The sun does what it does, and a virus does what it does. It's your response to it that matters. It's how you deal with the problem that you can see coming. And it's not impossible to see. And the World Health Organization didn't lie to Donald Trump. And China didn't sneak the virus into the country or create it in a lab to kill everybody or whatever bullshit is, is the latest thing. It was, it was on the radar since November. Uh, it had been an issue discussed back and forth over and over again in presidential briefings. And... Uh, and, and Trump spent January and, and February denying that it was a problem. Not and not not saying he didn't know about it because he no, but you couldn't possibly say you didn't know about it by January, November, December. Sure, and hardly anybody was paying attention to it. But by by the middle of January, when Chinese New Year was approaching, everybody was worried about it. I was in Taiwan. I remember I was in Taiwan in, uh, on uh, New Year's, New Year's Eve, the real New Year, and. Uh, hmm. Sorry, Chinese people. Uh, American New Year, <laughs> real New Year. That's not nice. Um, so I was in China New Year's Eve in Taiwan, not in China, and we were getting concerned about the virus. Then we we knew there was a virus in China, and again it goes back to SARS. It's like after SARS, we're like oh, they they there could be another nasty virus coming in China. And it's it's not that China does anything wrong. It's not because they bite the heads off bats. Uh, like Ozzy Osbourne or anything like that. It's that they have 1.4 billion people in densely populated cities, and it's very easy. That's prime conditions for a virus to spread. So people get infected, and boom, it spreads. It can spread really fast. Uh, and this particular virus, since it, it picks on people who have lung problems, loves to get out in polluted areas. Um, anyway, all right, so that was just interesting as a concept. Uh, uh, New York sub, I don't even know why they're running subways in New York, though. That's what's killing me. Why are the subways even running? How do you keep those things clean? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on a freaking hole in the ground, and I'm a New Yorker, I mean, I'm gonna go on a hole in the ground and get in a little metal box with whatever air was being breathed by 5,000 other people that day. Not that day, like an hour within the last hour. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, I imagine most. I don't know if most people. I don't know what the. I don't know what the world is like. I, I, most people must know. You know what a subway is, anyway. Even if you haven't been in a subway car, most people, I think, have been in a subway car at some point in their life. But it's a bus, basically. It's just a bus in the ground, and they're all linked together. But you are in this particular bus-sized space where it doesn't have seats. So every, I mean, it has some seats, but I mean, basically, there'll be. Oh, anywhere from like, if you're lucky, there's going to be 20 or 30 people. There could be 100 people plus per car. And those people change every stop you make. In and out, people go all the way down. So if you are riding um, 10 stops on a subway, it would be surprising for you not to be exposed to roughly, mm, I'd say almost 500 people in 10 stops. Um, you know, because that, that's that's 20, 30 people, 50, yeah, it's, it's going to be 20 to 50 people changing, probably 25% of the people change out every stop. And, and then new people come in. And so you get a new batch and a new batch and a new batch and a new batch. Um, no, okay, so let, let's say 250. So at least 250, but towards, could be as much as 500 uh, in 10 stops on a subway. 
So what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's virtually guaranteeing you will get the virus, <laughs> especially in New York where more than, where one out of 500 people are infected. So if one out of 500 people are infected and you go in a subway car, you are virtually guaranteed to be exposed to somebody who is infected. That's insane. Why is it still running? I don't understand the logic of that at all. Um, that should have been shut down on day one. Hopefully next time they'll make a point of that. Uh, and of course, if you do shut it down, though, you're already destroying New York, though, because that's how people get around. Um, and then and then you're shoving more people into taxis, which are just as big, because now you're sitting in a taxi that 25 other people have sat in today. Ugh, there's no good way around it. <laughs> <laughs> scooters. Oh, that's why they're allowing scooters. Now they're allowing scooters in New York because uh, they, they finally broke down and said, you know what? Scooters aren't so bad. Let people go around by themselves in a the scooter is a lot happier. Um, so reality check, a long slog. I agree with that one, obviously. Um, Los Angeles has people wearing masks. Uh, Etsy, by the way, you can get masks on Etsy. People are, A lot of Etsy craft people are making masks for you. And you know who's making masks? Um, um, uh, seamstresses, like cleaners, like people, you know, dry cleaners where they have a seamstress. A lot of them are making masks and selling them. Um, weekly mortgage applications sink 18%. You know, see, I mean, to me, anything's economically important. I'm going to put it up here. Um, Pelosi and Schumer, that's very important because that's more free money that we're going to be boosting the market, which is boosting the market today. Um, New York's virus toll is now with 4,000 dead. I mentioned that today. Wuhan is ending their lockdown today on the same day. Uh, <laughs> Trump, Trump doesn't. Trump says mailing in your vote is corrupt, but he can do it, <laughs> which I guess makes sense because you can't be more corrupt than that. I like these pictures. These are animals. They're taking back the territories now. Humans have given up these towns, so the animals are moving in and uh, <laughs> going shopping, going to the movies. That looks like really much like mine in Jersey. Wonder if it is. Anyhow, all right, so that's where you are there. Let's see if you have any questions. Um, <laughs> Greg says uh, Jess is home and he's looking. Uh, not sure how. He's not sure if that's good or bad at the moment. Yeah, I know it's a uh, crazy. A little too, a little too close for too long at a certain point. Uh, if you want to start an income portfolio, is this an okay time to get in? Absolutely, Robin asks if, if you want to start an, an income portfolio, is this an okay time to get in? This is the greatest time to get in. Um, oh, John Luke said he heard from Albo. Albo, if you're out there, hey, we were worried about you, um, but apparently Albo's fine. So, um, yeah, Robin, uh, not only is it a great time to start an income portfolio, but we are setting up a hedge fund that's effectively an income portfolio hedge fund to, uh, um, I, it seems to me like a phenomenal opportunity um, because, you know, we have our butterfly portfolio and we don't use it for an income, but we could use it for an income because conceptually, what do we do? We sell, we have positions that are bullish long term, so that's fine, but also we sell quarterly puts and calls to accentuate the returns. But we could take those quarterly puts and calls that we sell and distribute them as an income because <clears throat> like my mom's Raymond James account, it used to pay her, you know, 5%, 10% depends on the year. Now it's paying her nothing. I mean, I mean, I, I think she got a check for like a thousand dollars out of three hundred thousand dollar account last quarter. It's like, what's the point? You know, and she said, What am I gonna do with this? How am I gonna live on that? That's not that's not what she expected. And that was last quarter. It's going to be worse this quarter. And it's and and so many people are in that position. And now uh, the companies who are getting bailouts are not going to be able to get any um, pay their dividends. So there's going to be very few small choices for dividend stocks. Um, the buybacks are out. That's going to affect stocks also. And um, and of course there's no and of course thanks to the Fed now there's going to be no interest at all in the banks. So where, what are you going to do to make money? Bonds don't pay interest. Banks don't pay interest. Um, the dividends don't pay interest and now and 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 because everything else is so low, even if you buy corporate debt or or um or uh, local debt or municipal municipal debt, um you're still gonna get incredibly low rates of return. So how are people supposed to live in their retirement? 
So this is the greatest time ever to, for us to start a new hedge fund that pays you out a regular dividend. And uh, we, and we we think that we could definitely pay out two percent a quarter, and with it, you know without impacting the overall gains of the fund. So you can you can make money the way we do in our butterfly portfolio, and we can make quarterly payments. So I like that idea a lot. I think that's going to be a huge success. So we're putting that together, and the people already contacted us about it. If you are interested, contact Greg at BillStockWorld.com. And the people who now the hedge fund, of course, so it's not like you know you can't give them ten thousand dollars. It's got to be like hundred thousand dollar payments. Um, but if you are interested in that, um, we are going to be sending out shortly. I'm going to be getting back in touch with everybody this week who did already you know sign up, and uh, we and and we should be able to put the paperwork together quickly because we already have a regular hedge fund. So this is just going to be sort of like a sub fund. But it's it's going to be good. Everyone I talk to about it is like, yeah, it sounds good. I'm gonna, you know, because it's it's a People need a way to make some income. Eric said, did you turn the sound off? And then he said, now it's back. Okay. <laughs> no, I did not do anything with the sound. Now, Randy says they clean every three days. I don't know what that means. I seem to have lost the uh, thread on that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Walgreens Boots, a new butterfly play here was given low on the channel. And Levi, thoughts on this? Well, I like Levi. We talked about that. Um, I said that a few days ago. I think they're kind of a uh, what's Levi's symbol? Is it Le is it Levi? I was talking about them the other day that I thought they were going to be a good play because it's like again, it's like I like staple stocks like that because who's not going to buy Levi's? You know, you know, you're not going to kill Levi's because of a virus. I mean, yeah, I don't think too, I don't think right now I'm in sweatpants. I don't think anybody's going to be running out and buying more jeans. Levi's, just Levi's. Yeah, but they're a super cheap stock. He, oh, oh, not as much anymore. Wow, wow, he came back fast, huh? <laughs> they were so cheap when I was talking about them the other day. Look at that. Wow. Up 30% in a few days. So, yeah, when I was talking about it, it's like it was down at 10. I was like, oh, 10 is crazy. So now they're at 13. So the P went from 10 to 13, basically. Um, but, yeah, of course, it's Levi's. They, they, boy, what, oh, I know what I was saying. I, I was saying they've been around for 150 years. They, they, they're from the, from the, from the uh, San Francisco Gold Rush. That's when Levi's was founded. They were pants that miners used to wear. And, um, and uh you know, because they were rough and good for wearing and, and the, the dust and the lines and all that. And uh, so from way back then, so for 1850 or whenever the hell it was, it was 49, 1849, obviously. Um, so from 1849, they, they've been through the Depression. There was actually a Depression before the Great Depression. There was a Depression, the Great Depression, uh, two world wars. They always seem to manage to sell some jeans afterwards. So that was a good example of a stock that's like, why would you not buy it when it's $10? What do people think? And this is what I'm talking about when you say, listen to experts. You have these people saying, oh, the virus, it's going to be with us forever and the world's going to change and blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, that's not true. Okay? I'm sure in the Great Depression, the world was going to change forever. And it did change a bit, right? We actually have like a bit of socialism in America now, although not enough, obviously. Um, and then you've got, and they had World War One and World War Two. It was a war to end all. Remember the war to end all wars? That was World War One, And World War Two was... Uh, the end of the world, kind of basically. I mean, and then we thought, and then we thought we were all going to get nuked afterwards. Um, but meanwhile, people still bore jeans. Somehow or other, after you know, when the, as soon as the war ends, as soon as the depression ends, or whatever, people get back up and go, "I need a pair of jeans." You know, some things are obvious, but but somehow. These idiots who act like experts on TV are going to sit there and try to tell you, like, oh. No, this time's different. It's not going to be like that anymore. That will never happen again. You know, and, and <laughs> I mean, sometimes people are ahead of themselves. I mean, look, Amazon is, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, uh, Amazon was going to be the future of everything, right? And it is the future of everything still. If you say, well, sure, online shopping and so on and so forth. But you know what? Here we are in a situation where you're almost forced to buy everything online. And Amazon can't 
really execute everything they need to do to execute it. They're not, they aren't able to grow quickly. And I said this about them forever, that they were way overvalued because how could they ever grow to meet the demand that you're assuming they're gonna be at? And this was always my issue with Amazon. It's like as, as much as they make sense, and the end, first of all, you can see how much fun it is to only buy things online, right? You enjoying yourself? Is everybody having so much fun? So even if you did buy everything online, it's still annoying. So market, so Amazon with a trillion dollar market cap and their, um, how much sales? Financials, there you go. Brain, 280. So 280 million in sales. If it was 300, let's say it's 300 million. Six trillion is retail. This is 5% of retail. Yeah, they dominate online. Online is 10% of retail. Amazon is 5% of retail. They are half of all online sales go through Amazon. But as you are seeing now from your overdose of Amazon and every other freaking online person, right? It doesn't solve all your problems. You can't wait to go back to the mall. <laughs> you can't wait to go to an actual store and buy things. So. You know, this is the problem with Amazon, the PE ratio 88, 88. And we have a bullish bet on Amazon and the hedge fund because people won't stop buying it. It was the future, it is the future. And um, remember I said their package thing was, was, was a poorly thought out idea. They just suspended their package service. You know, they were trying to build up a UPS FedEx competitor internally and you'd say well how come now when they're super busy they can't do it well logistics are a problem it isn't as easy as they thought to compete once they had to actually compete with ups and fedex and once they actually have to fulfill a huge amount of orders and so on and so forth their whole thing fell apart and now they have to suspend and try it again um you know you have to be rational and step back and think for yourself on these stuff and don't listen to all these idiots, especially places like Seeking Alpha and whatever, but it's all the same. I mean, everybody, Forbes is all stringers these days. Uh, I'm sure they have some staff writers, but I mean, the majority of what you read from Forbes is stringers. Um, you know, Seeking Alpha stringers, Yahoo stringers, Motley Fool stringers, you know, like most of these places that you're reading the financial information from is just a freaking blogger basically. They're not particularly qualified people. And, they, and, they, and they, they're very happy to tell you their opinion of everything, but they don't know shit. And, they, and, and then you go to Yahoo and you look at the company news. And here's, um, this is from Yahoo Finance. So again, Stringers. I don't know what Banyan Hill is, but that's, that's just bullshit advertising. Oh, it says that, it even says it's that. Um, this is the street, Stringers. Uh, Barron's. I think that's still mostly staff. Zach's is mostly staff. This is another advertisement. I mean, half this shit is advertising. It really pisses me off. American City Business Journal. You know that, Stringers. Uh, another American City Business Journal. Somehow these people managed to get themselves shoved into the Yahoo feed. Um, the street. I Oh, I work at the street now. I should be nice to them. Uh, <laughs> I write for the street now. Um, Barron's. Uh, Investors Business Daily is, uh, that's staff, Zach's is staff, another advertisement, Market Watch, mm, I think it's mostly staff, Zach's, Market Watch, Investors Business Daily, but you know, you get news from, and this is Amazon, the Bloom, oh, finally, Bloomberg, <laughs> I mean, look how far it's, you have to go to get to Bloomberg, um, and this is all like today, eight hours ago, 11 hours ago, um, Benzinga Stringers, um, Stan, this is an ad from Stan's where they're just advertising their service basically and just trying to get you to read it. Um, hip ranks, <laughs> top analyst. All right, I'm sorry, I gotta check this one out. I gotta see what a top analyst is. Okay, RBC's Mark Mahaney. Let's see who Mark Mahaney is. <laughs> Mark Mahaney. Who are, oh, look at him, he's 47% successful. Wow, there's a guy we should be listening to. 
And what does he what does he put his things on? At 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 twenty four hundred, he said Amazon was a buy. What's his date? Date yesterday? Oh, that's his target. Sorry, sorry, that's his target. Um, he liked Pinterest. He likes Lending Tree. He likes Wix. Oh, these are all recent. He's like picking everything. Chewy. He really likes Chewy. He likes Etsy. He likes Shop. He likes Expedia. That's interesting. <laughs> But don't, don't you think like a guy should be better than a coin flip if you're going to be listening to his analysis? His average return is 6.6%. Don't forget there's like been 10 of the greatest years in market history and his average return is 6.6%. Is and that's when he's like, since 2009. So in the, in the, in the, in the greatest years of, in market history, he's averaged 6.6% return on his stocks and he's picked uh, 47% correct. And that's what they're calling a top analyst. But the problem is, unfortunately, who's got time to check everything other than me? But I'm, you know, uh, anal retentive in that regard. I mean, when I read something, I can't, I can't accept this. You know, when I see top analysts, I'm like, what does this guy actually know? Um, yeah, and it's so funny. And a lot of times you'll see these guys are like making opinions on things that they're not, it's not even their field. It's like not even what they usually follow. And they're sitting there telling you how it works. And the amount of people who, who claim to be experts in coronavirus and get interviewed on, but I blame Bloomberg and I blame CNBC. It's like they put these people on and they're not qualified to talk about it. Why does that not matter? I mean, I guess it's because you have an entire network on Fox where it doesn't matter that nobody's qualified, not even the host is qualified to talk about subjects and then go spouting off on it. Oh no, Trump is talking. The Paycheck Protection Program has been incredible. Oh my God, nobody's even gotten a check yet from that thing, but it's been incredible. Anyway, so I'm sure they're announcing it's being expanded. Democrats float five hundred. No, no, wait. Oh, no, no. The Democrats are proposing five hundred billion in new aid, and Trump is kind of indicating he's in favor of it. I don't know what's going on here. Oh my God! Bloomberg saying that. Uh, let's see. We're at two point four trillion so far, and the new measures will push us up to three point five trillion. 16% of our GDP is going to be stimulus. And that's not counting the Fed leverage, which is another three trillion on top of that. So that's kind of crazy. <laughs> wow. All right, where was I? I didn't remember what I was talking about. Um, we talked about Levi's and somehow, oh yeah, so I was talking about Levi's and value and whatever, right? Yeah. Um, Randy says, according to the article, the MTA cleans their cars every three days. Oh, shoot me now. Okay. See, this is where you need Washington to step in because I understand that the mayor of New York can't really shut down the subways because obviously the, the blowback would be unbelievable. How are people going to get around? What's going to happen? Blah, blah, blah. So, that's where the president of the United States has to be the bad guy and the health director of the United States. And then, and people in New York aren't going to vote for Trump anyway. So what does he care? Um, you know, you got to take the bullet and you got to say, I'm sorry, but I'm ordering uh, the subway cars in, in all major cities to shit, to be shut down. No, no, none of that public transportation. And people say, how people get to work, blah, blah, blah. You arrange something. I've arranged with Uber to give Uber $2 billion and lift $2 billion to pick up anybody who needs them. You know, that puts people to work, it puts money in the pocket, it saves the companies, blah, blah, blah. Do that. All right, give the taxis also. Let the taxis have some money too. As long as they follow your cleaning guidelines. And then everybody says, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you have to clean the car every single time you're done with the trip. It has to be sprayed, disinfected, blah, blah, blah. And then you're ready for your next passenger. And, and even that's not, obviously that's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And it's sure better than getting in a freaking subway car that nobody cleans for three days. Oh my God, that's that's sick. Oh God, holy crap. Okay, thank God, thank God, I had to talk to my daughters about this. Before. Right, two months ago, I said to my kids, I was like, "Do not take, don't go to New York." I basically told them, I said, "Look, 
I said, I escaped uh, Thailand and I went through Qatar and I was, I was really happy coming home through Qatar on, what was it, January, um, I think maybe the 5th. I think I was coming home on like the 5th or the 6th. So I flew from Thailand to Qatar. And I remember at the time, I was like, thank God I'm not going through um, Hong Kong or Shanghai because, in fact, I originally was thinking of, um, I was going to stay a couple of days in um, Hong Kong on my way over because at least it would be fun. I was going to break up my trip by staying a few days in Hong Kong. And fortunately, I heard about the virus before I left and I moved, and I moved my trip to, to Qatar. But even in Qatar, I was looking around saying, oh, I wonder how many people in Hong Kong are going through, through this airport. Um, I, so, so then, back then, I was worried about the virus. So back then, I had a talk with my kids and said, I don't want you to go to New York. Because obviously it's a hub. Um, I talked about the subways and how bad it was. I said, don't take the train to New York. Don't go to New York. Don't get on the subway in New York. I said, just leave it alone. <laughs> but it got way worse than I thought. I did not think it would get this bad. I mean, it's just, I mean, I can't believe how out of control they let things go. And that's the problem, though. I mean, the reason China was, you know, China was the best place we could have had this virus because they are uniquely positioned to contain their population. Western nations are not. We have, we, you know, in, in, in Asia, the people are generally uh, more obedient or more responsive to, the, you know, to, they're, they're responsive to the greater good. I wouldn't say obedient like it's a bad thing. They're more obedient as in if something is good for society, they are very likely to adhere to what's good for society. That's why people who are sick in Asia put on a mask. You know, people, people walking around with masks in Asia are not putting on a mask generally because they don't want to get sick. They're putting on a mask because they are sick and they don't want to spread it. It's a polite thing to do. Um, you know, we're not like that at all <laughs> in the West. And uh, even now, it's like, you know, they're telling people to wear masks and you can't get people to wear masks. You can't get, you can't get people in Florida to wear a bike helmet or, or, or a motorcycle helmet for that matter. So I think masks are right out the window. And um, it's it's really tricky though. I don't know what they're going to do. And 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 if this thing gets much worse, and you start losing your grocery workers and things. I mean, it already takes three four days to get something from a grocery store right now. If I order it, if we order it from online, they won't give you a time or anything. They just say, well, it'll be here by Wednesday. You know, I, I just got yesterday. I just got groceries that we ordered on uh, Sunday, and they they told us it would be there by Wednesday. And those times are slipping, and I ordered something else that'll be here tomorrow, maybe. Um, so, you know, you have to plan dance and there's still no toilet paper and all kinds of weird stuff that's going on. Anywho, so let's see if we've got any questions before I go back to a totally different subject. All right. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, we're going to look at the oil, which is a disaster still. So now, <laughs> the, the gist of this whole thing is that now we're going to have a global cartel for oil. Now OPEC is expanding to encompass the entire planet. I don't know if it'll be temporary or if they're always going to do it from now on, but they are basically now going uh, uh, to attempt to set a global price on oil. And it ain't going to be 30 bucks. I mean, it is in everyone's interest to keep oil around 40 not everywhere. I'm sorry. It's in it's in it's it's in the interest of the oil companies that oil should not be lower than forty because you know they can't make money realistically and whatever. But and for the consumers, forty is acceptable. Fifty is even acceptable for consumers. You start getting up to sixty, seventy, eighty, and it becomes bad for the consumers. But now you're giving the power to set prices back to OPEC basically, and now they're going to set the global agenda as much as possible, and it'll be. The, the, it, you know, if you allow this, the Washington should have some extreme jurisdiction over it. But of course, then I'm saying then you're going to give that power to Donald Trump, which is also objectionable. I would really honestly rather have OPEC have that power than Donald Trump. Um, but it's it's a very dangerous thing. You're, you're creating a nuclear economic weapon that, that this group is going to be able to set the price of oil at will. Um, you know. I mean, you know, OPEC's weakness was they didn't control the whole planet. They only controlled about a third of the supply on, in the world. 
and uh, and the U.S. increase uh, supply kind of kill kill them. Uh, you know, you're not just U.S. U.S. Canada Mexico. Uh, you know, even Africa started producing oil. It was causing problems for OPEC. Uh, and China's producing their own oil in places. So it's, it's you know, not good. And Russia, of course, so Russia became a huge producer. So, you know, they didn't control it up in the world to really have a good effect, and they started falling apart on them. But this is now completely out of control. So as of April 3rd, we had a build of 15.2 million barrels of oil um, a build of 10 million barrels of gasoline and a build of, it says 476,000 distillate. That's a lot less than I remember it being. Anyway, on the whole, but here's the thing. See all other oils, which they don't tell you about. This is where they hide oil. 448. So in other words, it's not gasoline. It's not distillate. It's other oils. We don't know what they are, doesn't matter, but the refinery makes things that don't fall into either of those categories. And therefore, since nobody tracks that in the report, it doesn't show up. But the reality is that also grew by 7 million barrels. So on the whole, we went from 1921 last week to 1954 this week, that's 33 million barrels build. One point that is that is that's almost two days of total use. That's two out of seven. So that's got to be about thirty percent. So thirty percent, thirty percent of the oil in the United States is not being used. The thirty percent of the oil that 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 basically is being refined is not being used. That's crazy. But then again, that's also in line with our expectations, right? That's how much of the economy is shut down then, 30%. It's very simple. There's a very, very direct relationship between the economy and the consumption of oil. So if the economy is 30% slower, then you're gonna see oil drop up. And, and of course, particularly hard hit, hit though, is transportation because nobody's driving anywhere, but there are still trucks on the road and there are some cars and stuff, but oh my God, is it a pleasure to drive places. Too bad there's nowhere to go. <laughs> but, but if you do have to go somewhere, like I, you know, I'd love to go to Miami right now. I could get there in 45 minutes, but uh, unfortunately there's nothing to do in Miami. <laughs> you know, if, if, if my uh, favorite sushi place was open, I'd go down there and get, and get some sushi and a steak, but it's not. Uh, that's great. You know, Jackie was down here, um, Valentine's Day, yeah, February 14th. Like, life was so normal, like just, um, you know, not even two months ago. It was just, and we were in Miami. It was, everything was just so nice and normal and happy, and this is crazy. All gone. It's like, you could say, it's like a nuclear, it's like the, it's like this, this, the after Terminator, after Judgment Day, it's just all wiped out, gone. Um, you know, it's it's just there's no point. To, it's it's weird. There's no point to going to Miami. There's nothing there that you can do. Um, we're 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 very lucky that this is. You know, it it really is very lucky that that things are still functioning. Like like it it isn't making people sick enough, or it's not making enough people sick enough so far that services are breaking down. But but you know, we're not that far away. If this gets worse, and if we weren't sheltering in place right now, and this was spreading and spreading and spreading, things would start shutting down. Not enough people would be showing up at the electric plant to make electricity. Not enough people would be at the uh, at the at the gas at the gas plant. You wouldn't be getting your natural gas supplies. You wouldn't be getting this. No, not enough people going fishing. Things start dwindling, and, and supply chains start breaking down. This could be so much worse. That, that's why you got to take action. You can't let, you know, you can't sit there and just laugh about how stupid Trump is. Somebody's got to do something. You can't let this go on. And, and I, I said this two weeks ago. I mentioned that today in the article. I said, look, two weeks ago, I said that we have a breaking point. And that breaking point is when one in 500 people are infected. 
All right, and we and and we know what that number is because we know how many people there are. There's 300 million people in the country. So when 600,000 people are infected, that's one in 500, right? <laughs> is you? Hang on a second. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. So 600,000 times 500. There you go. Okay, good. So make sure. So there are currently 400,000 people infected. I think I talked about this in this thing, right? Because we, we talked about, um, talked about, I think it's because I've gone to Poke Bowl. Because it was on the last week. Anyway, whatever. The short story is, though, that I went to Poke Bowl. Forget the oil, because it's like, it's just disaster. So in other words, this is completely unnecessary. There's no reason to have this much oil. It's ridiculous. And we are still exporting 3.3 million barrels. Look at that, we're still exporting 21, 22, 23 million barrels a week. So if we weren't exporting it, we'd have a 50 million barrel bill. What would, that? that's crazy. <laughs> so forget this, this is a complete disaster. Pokeballs, right, Pokeballs. Try to keep on track, Bill. Um, <laughs> so I decided, I, because I, I had gone to the Poke Bowl place and I, it occurred to me, I'm like, okay, let's see. So I washed my hands before I left. And I'm like, well, what's the, I, I, that's what got me thinking about it. I'm like, why am I washing my hands before I leave? My house is clean. That's not where the problem is. So now I have my perfectly clean hands. And I went outside. And like I said, I, li I live in a condo. So I, I go outside and my door is fine. I close my door. Then I go to the front door. Now, unfortunately, couple of hundred people touched the front door today. That's bad. I'm now touching something 200 people have touched. I'm not using Purell every five minutes. So I go, then I walk across the street, trying to remember not to touch my face, go to the door of the Poke Bowl store. I now touch a door that 200 different people have touched. Then I go inside the Poke Bowl place and I'm breathing the air that those 200 people have touched, those bastards. Now, I leave, oh no, as I'm in the Poke Bowl place, I now have to touch the machine because they have a machine that you have to shove your card into. So I have to actually touch the machine a little bit, which 200 people have touched. Um, same 200 people though, so we're all screwed anyway. We're all, we're all, we're all uh, virus buddies at this point um, because we both touch. And then on the way out, again, I'm touching the handle, the same 200 people have touched, but at least it's the same 200 people. So 200 different people in my building, 200 people there. Now I come back to the building, touch the door, not quite the same 200 people, but probably more or less the same 200 people. So I've been in, I've been in contact, not counting the street and all that. I've been in contact with, with 400 different people just to go across the street and get a Pokeball. That has put me in touch with 400 people. Um, so when, only one out of a thousand or one out of two thousand people has the virus, you got a pretty good chance of escaping. You know, and, and again, you're not definitely gonna catch it. You wash your hands as soon as I get in my apartment, I wash my hands again. Um, but you have um, you know, you have you have a, a good chance of not getting the virus when there's one in a thousand, one in two thousand, whatever, right? But when you get to one in five hundred people. Statistically, you came in contact with the virus in just the minute you go outside your door in a in a metropolitan area. You know, obviously, if you live in the country, you have a different things. Only you, you know, you're going to a store where less people have touched and so on and so forth. It's one, maybe one in a hundred. If you, you know, maybe you'll get a hundred contacts when you go out to your local 7-Eleven or something like that, just the people in your town or something like that. But that's still a lot. And if you and if you roll those dice five times and one in 500 people are infected, you are going to come in contact with the virus, and that's how this thing quickly gets out of control. Once you cross that threshold of around one in 500 cases, 600,000 cases in America, and we will hit that threshold, you you are at the point at which you can you can within a week go to 250. One in 250. And if it's one in 250, your chance of going to one in 100 becomes incredibly high. And once you're at one in 100, forget it. You're, you're, you're basically just made, you're just waiting till you get sick. And that's why I said this is the weekend.
we we did these numbers last time and we said this is how many people are going to two weeks ago i said this this is how many people are going to be sick on this day this is exactly the right month number four hundred thousand today going into the weekend we're going to hit five hundred thousand people infected coming out of the weekend by by monday something like six hundred thousand we're pet we're at that point we're at the critical mass and if it isn't slowing by monday if it's more than six hundred thousand on monday we got a big problem if it's if, if we start seeing it accelerating then then batten down the hatches as far as portfolios trade it doesn't matter what they tell you they're doing for the economy they have not got a handle on this thing at all and let's so let's take a look at the virus clock and see how we're doing and I, I I don't want to be depressing about this stuff, but but you know I mean really, um, it is depressing, but it's also important that we have an accurate idea of what's happening because because all of our trading is in the context of what's going on in the world. So last week, April first. 900,000, 45,000 dead, 190 recovered. The US, what? Oh, ah. there we are. 200,000 in the US, one week ago. Now, 1.5 million, 50% more people, 100% more in the US. So, Think about that. We're bringing up the entire world's average. If you take out the U.S. growth, it's 1.2 million, and the rest of the world grew 30 percent. Went from nine to 1.26. So let's say 30, 40 percent. So the rest of the world grew 30, 40 percent. We are growing 100 percent. We are causing the rest of the world to look bad. We America. Spain, 102, 146, 50% growth. Italy, 110, 139, 25% growth. France, where's France? 52, France is bad. 110, France is as bad as we are. How's Germany? Germany, 76. 109, 30, 30 something percent growth. China, no growth. Iran, 47, 64. That's 50% growth, basically. Turkey, 15,000, 34,000, 100% growth. They're bad also. Belgium, 13, 23. Pretty bad, but not as bad as us. All right, so you can see there's not enough, there's really, there's no countries worse than us. There's a couple that are almost as bad as us. How are our buddies in Canada doing? 8,500 to 17, they're doubling also. So we are on the worst end of the scale. And it's not just us. Everyone has to get under control because if, you know, and, and this is China's freaking out about this now because China's like, well, we're getting it under control, but you idiots are, 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 are blotting out the universe in red. You know, freaking Australia. Um, so, you know, China is dwindling and getting it under control, but everyone around them. So they're going to have to close their borders off to everybody else and stop people from coming back into the country and reinfecting their population. They don't want to do that again. So they but they but they know what to do. They're going to do the right. They're going to, they're they're not letting anyone in this country. You can't go anywhere. They're going to quarantine you if you travel to China so on and so forth. That's how it is now. That's why Macau's in trouble. And I do not understand why Wynn is doing well when you can't go to you can you can go to Macau but to go to Macau, you have to quarantine for two weeks in Macau, but not in, in the hotel. You have to quarantine in a quarantine area for two weeks before you're allowed into the actual city. So how badly could you possibly want to gamble that you would go through that? Um, there's no weekend trip to Macau. That doesn't work. 
Um, so when pop, I don't know what they're popping on. Like they got some money. I know what they got. They got a, a line of credit facility and so on and so forth. But I think this is going to end up squeezing down. Because I, I don't see this as a plus for them at all. And they're heavily, heavily dependent on that Macau revenue. Can we see that? Is that a thing? Ugh. What's happening? All right. Can't do that right now. All right. So we don't need that anyway. Um, what was I going to say? So that's weird. But anyway, so Macau, very bad. And I don't know what percentage. I, I think a good portion of Wynn's money is coming from Macau. Though, and plus, Vegas is shut down, too. So, But Vegas won't quarantine you. They'll let people in once it, once it lifts. But but Macau isn't really open. So everything's still closed. There's no good news here at all for these guys. Um, what were we looking for? Yeah. So, and again, I'm a numbers guy. What I care about is the rate of acceleration. So are we getting better or worse? So we went from 94. These are these are a week apart. These are all of our webinars. 94 to 121. That was um, 40%. 121 to 211. It's more like 60%. 211 to 441, obviously 100%. 441 to 905, more than 100%. So 905 to 1.4, about 50%, and 1.4, oh, there's no after. Okay, so 91. So we had, we had a slower rate of overall growth in the world, so that's good. But you can't obviously go by one week. You've got to see more than a week. But we had a slowdown. It didn't get worse. This was, this was heading into a complete disaster. That's why people are relieved. 441 to 905 is the end of the world. That's that's 441, 905, 2 million, 4 million, 8 million, 16 million, and, you, and everyone's dead after a couple after a couple of months. This had to stop. And that was the beginning of the month. We have a bit of control now. Things are slowing down a bit. But on the other hand, no testing. There's no testing here. Despite what Trump says, the, the, the amount of people being we haven't tested, we haven't tested a hundred thousand people yet. Um, well, I'm sorry, we have tested 400,000 people because it's 400,000 confirmed cases, but we, ha we haven't tested a million people, to put it that way. <laughs> well, let's not say 100. I'd say 100,000 a day we're not testing. But we, we've, maybe they tested a million people, 400,000 people have the virus. There's 300 million people here. You have no idea how many people have the virus. South America, no testing. There's no, there's no, there's no equipment for testing. Africa, no testing. Europe, getting better on testing, but not adequate. Obviously not adequate. Look at poor Europe. Um, Middle East, certainly no testing going on there, not enough. Okay, very, very well tested around here. These guys are testing the crap out of things. So, you know, we have to see the trend improving here. You know, the deaths are going to come. You're not going to be able to do anything about that. 45,000 to 80, 19 to 45. It kind of grows along the same path, though. 8 to 19, that doubled, 45,000 dead, 85,000 dead, that's just under 100%. You know what bothers me, though, the most? This is the problem. 190, you have double the deaths, but only 50% recovered. That's not good. But, again... This is nothing we didn't expect. We expected to be right where we are at this moment as far as the spread of the virus. But I did expect that by now there would be a complete shutdown in the United States. We don't have that. We still have nine states that don't even have people shelter in place laws. They're not even telling people to stay home. Um, and you have to kill the virus everywhere. You can't just kill it in certain places because then those people travel and start reinfecting everybody. I, I, it doesn't make sense. I mean, the way the way we're dealing with this is terrible. Um, I assume that they would start making masks in bulk, which we're kind of getting on top of the mask thing. Um, I assume that there would be um, masks, gloves, shelter in place, and the ventilators as treatment. I mean, it doesn't it? You know, if you stop people from being infected. 
I don't want to be mean. Even if everybody infected dies, at least you've got a controllable number. It's stopping the infections that matter. Saving people is, is obviously important, but it's not the point. It's stopping the spread of the virus. It would be, you know, there's two problems. Problem one, stopping people from getting sick. Problem two, stopping sick people from dying. But honestly, you can't let problem two distract you from problem one because problem one leads to problem two. So, you know, if you have, it's that flattening the curve thing. You have to stop people from getting sick. Otherwise, people will die. And that goes back to that one in 500 people thing because there are only, um, there are only two beds, two hospital beds per 5,000 people. Uh, sorry, per five, per, uh, per thousand people. We already determined that. So the national average is about two beds per thousand people in, in the country. So 0.2%. Um, and Obviously, one in 500 is uh, 0. 0.0, uh, wait, is more, is, is sorry, is, 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 oh, it's the same number. It's point two. I'm like, why does it sound like they know it is the same number? One in 500 is the same as two in 1,000. There you go. So effectively, when you have one in 500 people affected, of course, they don't all need hospital beds, but we use our hospital beds. Our hospital beds are 75% occupied anyway. So now here becomes a problem because apparently something in the neighborhood of 20% of the people who get the virus need to be hospitalized. And, and, uh, and a third of those people need ventilators. And that's where you run into trouble really fast with the numbers. Because if, um, you know, if, two mil if, if 2 million people get the virus, then um, 400,000 people need to be hospitalized roughly. And we don't have 400,000 hospital beds. That's a problem. And not, not to mention then, of course, ventilators and everything else. And that's the overall issue is this is our limit. And, and, and by the way, when I say the limit, it's like when I say the limit is 500,000, the reason the limit is five, 600,000 and you've got to stop it because stopping it doesn't mean you're going to stop at five or six hundred thousand. Obviously, it's going to keep going, but it means that at least you can say, if I if I've got a handle on this thing at six hundred thousand, and we can show it's diminishing, drastically diminishing, then then you can say you're probably going to peak out around a million, certainly less than two million. You're going to peak out and be done. You know, China got a. You can't see it anymore. <laughs> it got buried way down here. Where, where's 80,000? So cute. Remember when we are in China with 80,000 down here? Um, so China got a handle on theirs and flattened it out. And, uh, and the number of infections to this day in China is uh, 82,000. Right about 80,000 is when they got a handle on it and stopped the spread. How do they do that, though? Total lockdown. Total lockdown. You were not allowed out of your house unless somebody checked your temperature. You couldn't go anywhere. You could not enter a store. You couldn't go to a public place. You had to have a good reason for being on the streets, and you had to have no temperature and no symptoms. And that's the thing, by the way. That's also the weird thing in America. I don't understand why they don't do this. Why am I allowed to go to the freaking grocery store without having my temperature checked? It doesn't. You don't need a whole test. But I walked into a Walgreens the other day and I just walked right in. And I'm like, why am I, why am I just walking right in? They sell thermometers. Can't you just test somebody at the door and say, hey, don't come in here if you're sick. Use the freaking, you got a car, you, you, you know, drive to the drive-in window. Stay away from us. Um, it's so weird. It's like we just don't do a good job of this at all. China was dragging people out of the homes. If you're if you're infected in China, you had to go to a quarantine center, and and they would then check the background of everybody you came in contact with and test all those people. Because they took it seriously. 
We are not taking this seriously enough, and that's why we're still having these shocking numbers. And if we don't start taking it seriously, we are going to get to an uncontrollable level of infection, and we're very close to it. So that's what I worry about. And that's why uh, when we had a chance um, yesterday, we added to our hedges, we rolled our hedges, and now we're going to talk about the portfolios. But the point is, you, can, you have to at least, you know, you have to lock it in. You make the gains, you have to lock in the gains, you take a good portion of that money, and um, and you put it into some hedges because we don't know what's going to happen. Don't forget, Friday's closed. We only tomorrow is it? Uh, is it? Yeah, tomorrow's the last day. Okay, this week ends tomorrow. We don't have a lot of time to mess around here. So we have the Fed putting in, or not the Fed. We have the Congress putting in another five hundred billion dollars into the economy. So of course we're having a good day today. We have Trump saying he's got a miracle cure. We've got uh, the, the people saying we're going to go back to work as soon as possible. Blah blah blah. All this stuff. It's all probably bullshit. But if we find out in some horrible way that it's all bullshit on uh, Monday, that we find out that we are well over 600,000 cases and that, um, they, that they find out something else is bad or whatever, we, we can the market can take a huge dive again. So we just want to be prepared. All right. So there's the background. There's the market. And that's what we're doing. Now, yesterday... Okay, so yesterday, portfolio protection. So we took a look at the income portfolio. All right, and that, that's the only portfolio we have where the hedges are in the portfolio. We didn't, in the other portfolios, the short-term portfolio is covering. But in the income portfolio, I wanted to have at least one portfolio where the hedges are in the portfolio, and that's where this is. And that was on 55% uh, on Monday. What all we didn't make a big change. All we did was well, we didn't, this didn't happen because we never got a dollar. It never went out to a dollar, so that's a null trade. It's a pending trade. When we get to a dollar, we'll do the cover. The only change we actually made because SDS we didn't touch. Oh no, we don't have SDS in this one. Sorry. Is we changed our SQQs and we got a little. We got more aggressively long on SQQ on the ultra short on the Nasdaq. So. We luckily the market was up yesterday, and let's see what the future looks like. So this was yesterday morning, and we were up here. You know, because this is when the market actually opened. Okay, zero. Five minutes on. Nope. Shit. There's no good way to do that. Oh, anyway, so yesterday morning we had that nice big open, so it was like a good time to add hedges and so on and so forth. So we did this one and we did the short-term portfolio also. And what we did is we took advantage of this gain and we took the money that we made on that gain, took about half of it and put it into a hedge. All right, and and, and there's very solid reasons. That. First of all, don't forget these hedges pay a fortune on the way down. Also, though, it's we're locking in the gain. I'd rather take half of the gain and, and spend it on the hedge to lock in the gain so that if we come back, we don't lose any more money because we lost too much money last time. Remember, we, we, we were getting worried about our positions. Um, so now the income portfolio, do, 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 do. No, earnings portfolio, sorry, call the income portfolio. Earnings portfolio. Whoa. Oh, okay, good. 96%. Um, yesterday it was 155. And then we made the adjustments. We spent the money on the hedges. And now it's up 76. Not because the hedges are doing that well, although they are doing okay because they um because we, you know, we we we're still lower than we were yesterday, but really it's because these longs are coming back now. We're doing well on our longs, but that's what balance is all about. It's a sort of an ebb and flow thing, and it seesaws back and forth. But the idea is that you can make money in both directions. So, like our short-term portfolio, 
is at 538. Now, remember last week, I think, I think this was about five, but the long-term portfolio was down about three, if I remember correctly. But now this is at, this is at 538 and the long-term portfolio came back. That's the key. And it's flat, but that's flat's fine because it's $500,000. So now we have over a million dollars in our two portfolios. The long-term portfolio at one point was down close to 50%. And what did we do when it was down 50%? Because we had, because 50% of the long-term portfolio was 250, but the short-term portfolio was up over 400. Remember when I said, I, I remember at some point they were like, they, the two of them combined were basically around six, which is what we started with. When we started, the short-term was 100 and the long-term was 500. So 600 total thousand dollars in the two portfolios. As we went down and down and down, the short-term portfolio went up to 400, but the long-term dropped to 250. That was 650. They were basically about the same. But then we added more hedges to the short-term portfolio as the market came back up. But we took the money from the short-term portfolio. We didn't take the money physically, but we, because we knew we had the money, we were willing in the long-term portfolio to roll and add to our positions, to take, to take that second layer in of the scaling in position. So we, you know, we hadn't made huge commitments to the long-term portfolio because most of the positions were pretty new. They took a huge loss because we're using options and we have leverage, but uh, it's a huge loss percentage wise, but on the whole, we still had a lot of cash and a lot of buying power left over. And knowing that we had also the profit in the short-term portfolio, I mean, we, we hadn't actually lost any money. But what's the point of that if you don't take advantage of it? And the advantage should be taken was to say, here's all these beautiful positions in the long-term portfolio that are now 50% lower than they were before. You know, and so what did we do? We sold all these puts, right? And we sold all these puts and got how much money? Um, 25, freaking 45, 50, 60, 75, 80, uh, 90, 100, and 20. So about $125,000 roughly. So about 100, so we sold $125,000 worth of puts. And when did we do it? 317, 312, 323. And this week, what was going on that week? Mm, son of a bitch. Ne ah, it's never the right length. All right. This one works through. So what I say, 317, look, 317 to 323. Here it is. See that spike down? What happened then? The VIX spiked up. What about here? The VIX spiked up. It wasn't so much that the market was down. It was the VIX was up. And therefore, what do you know for sure when the VIX is up a lot? It means you're going to get a huge amount of premium. And what's the safest place to collect premium? The puts. Now, you might say, oh, no, that's not safe. And in fact, that's the number one thing I get from people on Seeking Alpha because they don't understand options is they're like, it's not safe to sell a put because then you have to buy the stock. It's like, yeah, but if you're going to buy the stock, if you're an investor who is going to buy the stock, then what do you care if you get assigned the stock? And, and if you believe the stock is going to go to zero, that shouldn't be one of the stocks that you're investing in. You shouldn't be selling puts in it. It's not a random thing. We pick a value stock that we think is extremely well priced, and then we sell a put to get a much lower price than that. Um, so we sell these puts. We sold $125,000 worth of puts. That puts cash in our pocket. We sold specifically low margin puts. We purposely look for puts that we've not have it. We're not a heavy margin penalty. And in fact, well, let's take a look. We sold, oh, look at energy transfer. So you got burned on energy transfer, though, didn't we? Um, we sold Apple 150 puts for $14. We sold, um, oh, these are, this is an older, wait, is that? 
Well, that's weird. Well, first we sold 230 puts. Okay, that was aggressive. We sold the June 230 puts for 37.50, and I guess we we felt like that was a really good price at the time. Then we sold these for the 150 puts for the 2022s. That's that's a more you know obviously it's never going to get that low. Um, this is more of a bet, and that's more of a fundraiser. Uh, ADP. We sold the um, $80 puts for 12. This is a, it's at 137. Boeing. We sold the $75 puts for $28. You know, the, these things are ridiculous. That's why we sold them. Caterpillar. And you and, and again, every single one of these stocks is a stock you're gonna you're gonna want to own 20 years from now. Caterpillar sold the $50 puts for five bucks. It's at 125. I mean it wasn't it wasn't then, it was lower, but it was a ludicrous price. And you know, and, and again, it goes back to the whole fundamental issue. Okay, I'm a fundamentalist. So I don't care, you know, I don't care what the chart looks like. And I know that sounds like blasphemy to a lot of people. Like, how do you not care what the chart looks like? Because all the chart tells me is how dumb people are. People are this dumb. Okay. Um, you know, we were, you were talking the other day about water. Water freezes at 32 degrees. You could argue that it depends because water could have impurities in it. You could be at a different altitude. All the, these things would affect the freezing temperature of water. It's, but it's going to be around 32 degrees. It's not necessarily exactly 32, but there are other factors. But still, on the whole, it's water. It freezes at 32 degrees. So now I have bets by people who say, this is where I think water is going to freeze, because there's no difference. The price of a stock, the freezing temperature of water, they, there's no, you, you can't just bet on it. There's a real value to the stock. And this is, this is what a fundamental investor believes. And I know that's very hard for people who are chart people to accept that. There is a fundamental value to a stock, just like there's a fundamental value to, to a Toyota Camry. Because in order to build a Toyota Camry, I need this part and this part and this part and this part, and I need to ship it from here and here and here, and I need to assemble it with certain workers, and they get paid a certain amount per hour, and I need this much floor space in my factory for this many hours to do it, and that costs me this much in rent, and then I have to put it together, and then it requires these products and this finishing, and so on and so forth, Then I have to ship it somewhere to a dealership, the dealer has to sell it, somebody has to get a commission, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, a Toyota Camry cost $24,000. Okay, that's what it costs. You can pay $30,000, you can pay $20,000, you can pay $8,000, you can pay $150,000. It doesn't matter what you pay. It's worth $24,000. Same thing with a barrel of oil, so on and so forth. Things are worth a certain amount. They're worth what they cost to produce. And over time, that will true up. Now, maybe the labor goes down, maybe the materials go down. There's certain factors that are variable. But overall, you can make a pretty damn close prediction on what it's worth because that's what it takes. Okay, Apple. Apple will sell this many iPhones. Within, within plus or minus, they're going to sell 500 million iPhones or 200 or whatever they sell per year. They'll sell a little, little, little. Let's say they sell 200 million iPhones a year. So Apple's going to sell 200 million iPhones. Maybe they'll sell 175 million. Maybe they'll sell 225 million. It's not likely to be plus or minus out of that range. Okay. They will sell this many iMacs. They will sell this many laptops. They will sell this many iPads. They will sell this many music subscriptions, blah, blah, blah. The, it's in the aggregate. It's a fairly predictable thing. Okay. Barring any massive change or massive thing or whatever, Apple's going to make this much money this year. And you know this because you know in earnings, people beat by a penny or miss by a penny and everybody freaks out. But have you ever thought about how come you can predict earnings to the penny? 
All right. Some of it's financial engineering, of course, but the bottom line is the company is able to control their earnings and make a projection and stay in a range and do what it takes to get to that place where they made a projection. Obviously, something like a virus or whatever can blow it out of the water. But in reality, the company fundamentally, unless they're lying to you, is worth a certain amount. So you say, OK, that's what they're going to make. Apple's going to make $60, million, $60 billion this year. And how much do I pay for a company? I will pay 15 times earnings for a company. Therefore, Apple is worth $900 billion. And $900 billion on Apple is, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, what am I doing? Yahoo, Yahoo. Here we go. I'm probably over that now. That is not Apple. So Apple's at 1.2 trillion, but they probably make more or whatever. Let's see what they are financially. No, they're at 20 times earnings. That's where they are. So they made up oh, net income. Yeah, 60. So they'll make 60 billion this year. Okay. Or or less because of the virus. So but the point is, so Apple, Apple is actually trading a bit high in the range, which is why we don't have very enthusiastic targets on them. I think they're worth. You know, right about a trillion, a little bit less, and that's 10% lower than they are now, or or 20% lower than they are now. So basically, 220, 230 is low, I think, for Apple. At which point they become very exciting. Um, so what did we sell? We sold the 230 puts for 37.50 because I think that'll true out on earnings. Okay, these are a joke, and that's what I mean, though. I know Apple's worth much more than that. I can't envision a scenario in which Apple could possibly get that low. And here's Clorox. Energy transfer is much lower than I think it's worth now, but unfortunately it's too weird, so we haven't been pressing it. Um, Payne's brand, you know, it's very solid, like uh, Levi's that we were just talking about. IBM, ridiculous. $80 puts sold for 12 bucks, net $68. Seriously, Intel, $30 puts for three, net 27, half the price it is now. Coffee, that's probably flat. Yep, that's flat. So coffee was a bet based on where we are now, but still low. $30 puts sold for $1.70. Um, Lockheed Martin, stock of the century, 160 puts. It's 367. We sold the 160 puts for $16. This is just free money that's being handed out to rich people who have margin. And by the way, the margin was super low because it's so far out of the money. And if you have a margin account, if you have portfolio margin account, it doesn't, you barely get charged anything. Once you go 20% out of the money, you, don't, you get almost no charge at all. In, a, in an ordinary margin account, these are ridiculously low because you're so far out of the money. It was only the VIX that made it possible to get these prices. Uh, and as you can see, they're already up 50%, 40%. We just sold these things a couple of weeks ago. It's the VIX compression that made them profitable. Um, uh, Medtronic, Vail Resorts. Uh, again, we, they, we, just, we just talking about Vail because of my house. Um, so we have the um, the 100 puts for 14 bucks. Again, it's 85 bucks. Notice the trend here, 50% below the price. Maybe it wasn't the price at the time, but it was a price I felt was ridiculous. Uh, and tenant healthcare. All of these are blue chip stocks. All of these are at insanely low prices, irrationally low prices. And we collected $125,000 in the course of seven days selling puts. All right. And why am I doing this? Why do I why do I go over these and whatever and talk about it? Because you've got to you've got to believe it. Because if you don't, it's like practicing. Uh, it's like practicing a, a basketball play. It's like practicing a football play. It's like practicing your swing in baseball. If you don't practice and if you don't get your mindset right, then when the situation comes up, when you have to execute and you fail to take advantage of it, you blow the opportunity. And the next time the opportunity comes, it could be ten years. I mean, look at the VIX. Where's the VIX? Here's the VIX. Here you go. This is how often we get a chance to do this. 
Okay, 2009, 2011 was pretty good. So 2009, 2011, and now. That's it. Three times in 10 years. And, well, whatever, 11 years, whatever. But three times in a decade, you get a chance to sell when the, when, when the volatility is registering that high. <clears throat> you have to be ready for it when it happens and you have to understand what the mechanics are of what we're doing. But to, to not take advantage of that is, is criminal. And, and by the way, even, you know, we, we do this all the time, of course, every one of these spikes, and not just for the VIX, but don't get individual stocks, you know, certain stocks plummet for dumb reasons, and we take advantage of it. That's essentially our strategy. As value investors, what do we do? We look for stocks that get beat up for stupid reasons, and we invest in them. And we scale in carefully, we pick up a smaller position, and then if it goes lower, assuming we still like the story, We'll buy more. That's why we have such a huge position in Macy's. That's why we have such a huge position in, in, Tangier, in SKT, in Tangier factory outlets. We we started out with a, a re, medium-sized position, but then they gave it. They said, would you like to buy lower? Would you like to buy lower? Would you like to buy lower? And we keep saying yes. Sure, you want to, you want to sell me more for half the price? Yeah, why not? You want to sell me more for half the price? I'll half again? Yeah, sure. You know, if I like Macy's, if I like Macy's at 15, I love Macy's at four. Nothing happened, nothing changed. Yeah, well, something, I'm sorry, nothing happened. Something happened, the freaking virus. <laughs> but it wasn't really the virus that was killing them. They were going, they were, they were spiraling out of control anyway. This was just the last straw. But if I was liking Macy's here, and then you tell me you're going to give it to me for four, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to back up the truck and say, how much can I buy? I don't think they're going to die. I don't think that the virus destroyed the, the place in a month. They could be closed for three months. They will recover. That goes for a lot of places. This is irrational thinking. This is the, I, I don't know what people really think is going to happen long term. But, you know, like I said before, far from retail being dead, I think this illustrates how retail is never going to be dead because this sucks. Your dream existence is to sit at home and never leave the house and have everything delivered to you. This is what you want. You like getting your food delivered to you instead of going out to a restaurant. You like getting all your freaking groceries delivered to you instead of going to the store. Is it really a better life? No, it sucks. I don't want to have more free time to sit home and watch TV. I'm not interested in that. I want to go out and talk to people. I want to sit and have dinner with my friends. I want to go to a bar and have a drink. I want to go to the store and look at stuff and walk around and, and, and pick up the items I might want to buy. That's the other thing you realize when, you should, you know, when you're doing this Amazon stuff, right? You don't realize that you go to the store and look at things and then you come back and buy it on Amazon stuff. It's kind of boring when you buy it. Everything's a reorder. Because you can't, the, the online thing is not very good for shopping. Like, so it's actually like shop and find new stuff. It's not very good for that. It's really like you keep reordering the same thing you already have because you don't want to take a chance on new stuff. Ooh, we're up 700 points now. Very nice. So anyway, so the market's coming back. And, and so like I said, you only get a few chances to get to take advantage of positions, situations like this. And if that's the time, you've got to train yourself that that's when you take advantage. Instead of panicking, you've got to take advantage. And you also have to train yourself to always be ready for that to happen. And how do you make sure you're ready? You've got to hedge. You've got to have cash ready to go when the market crashes. You can't have the market crash and be scrambling to, to fix your margins and doing this and that. You should never be over-invested. Our system doesn't require you to be over-invested. And, and, and the idea is it's a pump. So the short-term portfolio pumps money in when the long-term portfolio goes down. And now the long-term portfolio comes back. Now, if the short-term portfolio goes to zero, which it won't, but if the short-term portfolio goes to zero, 
that would be because this goes to a million dollars. I'm still going to have the same million dollars. Now, in reality, what we'll do is we'll pull the hedges and maybe the long, maybe the short-term portfolio will fall from 500,000 to 350 or something like that while this goes up. But at a certain point, we'll get we'll we'll stop being too bearish in the short-term portfolio and this will get to fly and we'll still have 300,000 in the short-term portfolio. And then this this will be a million and we'll have 300,000. But right now, these two combined portfolios, which we only started back in October, are now a million dollars up from 600,000. But why? Because we take advantage of the drop because it, the, this 125,000 is already up 60,000 over here. And then of course, there's all the positions we rolled and we pushed. We don't even have that. How do we not have Apple in this portfolio? That's crazy. But you know, look, we, we even we even have well, we have the Amazon short puts. Why are they there? Why are they not with the other puts? That's weird. See, we sold Amazon puts too. Nine look at nine hundred dollar puts, one thousand dollar puts. We collected fifty thousand dollars promising to buy Amazon for half the price. You know, and, and they're up fifty percent already. We already made twenty five thousand dollars. That's crazy in, in, in a couple of weeks. But why? We took advantage of the spike in the VIX. And, and honestly, when those things go up 50, 60 percent, I'm not going to wait two years to get my twenty five thousand dollars because I can make more. I can make more money than that with the cash. And I don't need the risk, even though it doesn't seem very risky at all. And it, maybe it's taking up no margin. I might end up leaving it. But you know, even though it's not very risky at all, if I ever need margin, I certainly would take it out of these guys, right? Um, Broadcom, Berkshire Hathaway. It's like, why would I not want these positions? Cisco, Discover Card, Freeport. Freeport's actually not doing well. That's that's still good for any trade. Gilead, that was our first virus trade. Um, General Motors having tr they're going to be in trouble. I'm going to kill that one. Um, they're they're shaky. Um, IMAX, right? Okay, IMAX is a good example. That's one we got super aggressive on. So we're very bullish on these guys now. Deep position, gonna be a while. Labu, the biotechs, I like them. Uh, LB, of course, we always like. Macy's is oh, it's not it's not oh yeah, it's pretty big. It's sixty. We got sixty longs now, and then and, uh, and the oh, 60 longs, forty puts, and only twenty uh, short calls, and they're way up. Um, Middleby is the uh, grill people, which I still think will come back nicely. MJ is the ETF that we're just playing for income. Philip Morris, Tanger, Fang, Fang, Tanger Outlets, we have 4,000 of those now. Um, Sun Power, TD Bank, Toll Brothers, uh, Te uh, Textron, Vail, also another mining play. Uh, Viacom which I couldn't believe how low they were. They're coming back a little bit now. Oh, in fact, now they're, now they're in the money. We, we got so uh, cautious about Viacom that they're in the money now. And that's the thing also, we're not asking the market to rock it back up, are we? We actually rolled the Viacom to a position. Ah, where'd it go? That's crazy. I can't believe that's our target. <laughs> we rolled the Viacom into a position where we had the 515 spread. And that's a ten dollar spread at net four. And we sold the puts though. So our net cost of the trade, 27 plus 15 is 42, minus 35 is a credit. Five thousand dollar six wait, five five thousand dollar credit on a spread on a fifty thousand dollar spread. Okay. $5,000 credit on a $50,000 spread. This spread is still only 6,000 bucks. And and the target is $15. I want to I want to be really clear about that. See that? That's our target for Viacom in 2 years to make $45,000 on a $5,000 currently spread. So is that good for a new trade? Well, it's not as good as a $5,000 credit, but it's pretty freaking good, right? And did we have a trade? We had Viacom before. 
we had a smaller position, and we rolled the crap out of it. We jumped on it, and we expanded it, and we pushed it, and we said, yes, I want more. It got cheaper, and I wanted more. The chart looked like crap, and I wanted more. Here we are, March 23rd. That's when we made this change. That's what it looked like. That's the worst time you can capitulate. That's You have to say to yourself, is this logical? All this chart tells me is that these people are idiots. They don't understand how Viacom works. They own a stock that they don't understand. It's CBS. It's MTV. It's um, whatever, Comedy Central. I mean, it's, you know, it's, this is CBS Viacom. What, what's, what, you know, I mean, yeah, they have studios, they produce shows, blah, 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 things are on hiatus. So what? Are we going to stop being entertained? Are we never going to go to sports again? Is it all over? Are we, are we packing up society and going home? Oh, I see. Fauci. Oh, they're still doing this freaking Trump thing the whole time we've been talking. Fauci saying turnaround is in sight. So, of course, we get it. That's why we're getting bumped. But that's why you take it with a grain of salt. Because, again, we're going into a holiday weekend. They want you to be happy. They do not want you freaking out into the holiday weekend. That doesn't mean you shouldn't freak out. So we have to be careful about it right now. So we hedge. That's all. That's why we rolled our hedges. Walgreens boots. How could Walgreens boots not be doing well? That doesn't even make sense to me. All right, we took a, we've been taking a hit on this one, but this makes no sense to me. I'm going to stick with that. Exxon. Oh, well, that turns out to be a good call. <clears throat> Oil's coming back. Exxon's coming back. <clears throat> Our target is 60, but we're in at 30, and it's 42 already. We sold, the, we sold the 27.50 puts for $7. Oh, my God, is that crazy? What the hell could Exxon have looked like? Oh, yeah, wow, Jesus. And again, I'm not better than you, okay? I just practice more. I've just gone through this enough times where I can confidently get up there and say, this is bullshit, okay? I'm not a chart person. That's very important thing to understand about me, though. To me, this tells me what people have been doing. It tells you the past. It does not tell you the future ever. Then that's where people can, that's where people blow up their lives because they think a chart predicts the future and it does not. A chart tells you what did happen. And there's a difference. It's a history book. Okay. You can read a history book about World War II. And you can understand it thoroughly. And you can understand every single thing that happened in World War II. But that does not mean you know how to fight Vietnam. It's not the same. And that's the problem people have with the charts. They think that looking at the past is going to tell you the future. But it's not. Even if it's the same company, the same company isn't the same. The company you trade isn't the same anymore. You don't. People don't understand that. The company changes managers. They change directors. They have a new marketing direction. They have a new uh, a new CEO. A new CFO comes in. They decide to do something else. The board changes their mind about something. They merge with somebody. They acquire somebody. They do different things. They cut a division. They add a division. You you know to assume that you're looking at the same thing, and that goes back to the water thing. Water freezes at 32, but not if you put a, not if you add a, 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 a cup of salt. Then it won't freeze. But the chart tells you it freezes at 32. You've got a chart that says 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32. And if you don't know that they added a cup of salt, and it goes down and down and down, or I'm sorry, it freezes, yeah, it freezes at 32, then it says like 27, still not frozen, and you go, oh my God, it's going to go to zero. No, it's not. They added salt. That's going to change the temperature to 26 to 24. That's all. 
the chart will stop and turn at 24 because you understand why it went from 32 to 24. And when it goes to 24, you will say, you know what? That's as low as it can go. It's not physically possible for it to go lower. Okay, that's how I look at a stock. And that's why when this kind of stuff happens, I'm gonna make those calls in the middle of the crisis while the crisis is going on and while other people are freaking out. That's what you've got to learn how to do though. You've got to learn. That's why we review and review and review because you've got to learn by example. You've got to learn when it happens. And, and it, it, while this is a unique event, we take full advantage of this right away. It's not, a, it's not so unique because every earnings season, we have opportunities like this. Every single quarter, this happens to, to dozens of stocks, hundreds of stocks sometimes. They, meet, they beat expectations, they missed expectations, but it's a lot of times it's because people simply don't understand how the company functions or what changes they made. Like LB, they sold Victoria's Secret. They, I don't remember when that happened. It happened around here. I think it was somewhere around here. They sold Victoria's Secret but they didn't sell it. They took, I'm sorry, they took it private. So they took the Victoria's Secret part of their business private, but they only, but but they still own half of it. So they they collected like 500 something million in cash. So they effectively sold it for for a billion dollars. They got 500 million in cash, which is great for the company, uh, and they couldn't have gotten it at a better time because that's right when the virus hit and everything fell to ship. And now they they're sitting on 500 million in cash. Um, but they're still going to get half the profit. So the impact on their profit is not such that it washes away the cash. The cash is going to carry them for years. It's, they only make, well, it's it's so easy to find out. That's what I don't understand people. Because all you got to do is go to LB and you say, hmm, let's see. Here's LB. And LB made $600 million last year. And of that, 200 million came from Victoria's Secret. So 500 million is as much money as they make on Victoria's Secret in two and a half years. But it's not really two and a half years because they're still gonna get 100 million of the 200 million a year. Not only that though, but the partner who bought them, the venture, the company that bought them, didn't buy Victoria's Secret to, to, to keep them at 200 million a year. They obviously expect to be able to expand the business. They're gonna put money into it and increase the business. That's their whole plan. But even forgetting that, just assuming they still get their 100 million a year, that means that Victoria's Secret is now producing double what it used to produce for LB for the next five years. So how is that a bad thing? How does that negatively impact the stock? Yet when the news came out that they were, that they were taking Victoria's Secret private and selling half of it, the, the company tanked. Why? Because the people who own the stock identify them with Victoria's Secret. And they think if you sell it, it's no good anymore. Let me, I, we did the same thing with iRobot. And, and, we, and we weren't wrong, but iRobot spun off their military division. It's not going to show up on here. I don't think it's too long. Though. iRobot spun off their military division, and we had been very heavy into iRobot. Um, it was around here, I think. And uh, we said, we said, screw that. Now it went up first, and I I could I could not for life me understand why we got out we we got out too early we could have made another you know twenty thirty percent, but I mean I just didn't understand I said what well, why do I want them without the uh, this division then we didn't touch it and it went up and up and up and we said oh well bye bye iRobot but then all of a sudden it came back down and I was like oh now I want them again, but without the military division I didn't see the point of this price. But you've got to understand your companies. You've got to understand the real value of something, not going by the chart. Things change. Even the Dow Jones, I made a whole point about that a month or so ago. I, I said, I was talking about how the Dow Jones is grossly overinflated because they keep changing the components. And so does the S&P. The S&P continually dumps its underperforming components. It's only putting in the best stocks. They are the 500 top market cap stocks. Any stock that starts failing in its performance gets kicked out of the S&P, like Macy's just did, in fact. And um, 
And that distorts the S&P, though. It keeps driving it higher because it's only, it's only showing you how the winners are doing. It's not showing you how the losers are doing. A stock that's a loser that was in the S&P five years ago is going to get kicked out of the S&P and won't affect it anymore. So how do you compare the S&P 500 of 10 years go to the S&P today when they keep changing who's in the S&P? Not the same thing. And the Dow is egregious. I mean, the Dow is, I think we calculated the Dow is about 30% inflated due to, due to changes. Um, oh, geez, already three o'clock. Anyway, all right. So let me see if we have any questions. So I hope I got my point across. I mean, the, the point is that you've got to trade value and you've got to take advantage of the market moves. And you have to think to yourself, the best way to take advantage of the market when it went way down was to say, well, what can we do to take advantage of it? Well, number one thing we can do is sell puts. When people are willing to give you ridiculously stupid prices for puts, take the money. Because frankly, in a $500,000 portfolio, taking $125,000 is 20%. And in a shit market like this, 20% was great money. So if that was all we did for the year is just sit there and stare at those short puts and hope that they all expired worthless, we still would have had a nice return. But we didn't because we took that $125,000 and we put it to work rolling our longs lower because we felt like everything was being underpriced. And now it's paying, well, it's not really paying off yet, is it? Because our portfolio is only flat but it's paying off because the short-term portfolio, our hedges are extremely profitable. And all we have to do now is really just sort of, you know, pull back on the hedges a bit and uh, let the longs ride. But this portfolio, just like our hedge fund, in fact, our hedge fund's in a position to double up. If the market recovers, the long-term portfolio also is definitely in a position to double up if the market recovers. We're gonna make half a million more dollars. Just if the stocks get halfway back to not not all the way back to normal, because we're being conservative, we just want to go halfway back to normal. That's how we're playing it. But it's all about balance. You've got to balance things out. Oh, the Fed minutes. Forgot about the Fed minutes. <laughs> all right. Uh, Greg says, Phil, can you uh, walk through the setup of a new butterfly position? No, I can't right now, but uh, ask me in chat. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, Brendan says, when do you get back into WTI 20? Doesn't OPEC only control Brent? No, OP well, Brent and WTI are linked. But yeah, of course, they only control, um, they only directly control Brent. But now if they're making a cartel with Canada and the US and everybody else, they're going to control everything. Um, but in either case, WTI and Brent are generally hand in hand. They're not totally separate animals. So when do I get back into oil? I don't I don't know if we're going to have a chance. I don't know what's going to happen. If it does go lower, I will be happy to get in because I think 20 is a ridiculous floor for, for oil. I don't know where it is now. Um, da, 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 da. Where am I? Wow. Oh, my God. It hit 20. Well, <laughs> oh, no, that's a that's a monthly chart. I was like, that could not, it did not happen today. <clears throat> yeah, so it's already, it's already coming back. I'm not, you know, we have the USO play, and that's all I'm doing for oil. I'm not, I don't want to play it day to day or anything like that. Gasoline, I should have, well, I wanted to go on gasoline 65, but I missed it, and that was just today. But I forgot, I was busy, so whatever. So if it comes back down, I'd like it. If not, no. <clears throat> What's your favorite stock to invest in today? And would you start from scratch? Which 2022 option chain? It would be the it would be SKT still. I still think it's ridiculously underpriced. Um, SKT, Macy's, IBM. Um, who else is silly? Um, IMAX. IMAX is another one. You know, they're all in our portfolio. You can check them out there. Um, all right, the Fed minutes are out. I don't know what the Fed ever said. We'll find out in a minute. When you get home with your hands, wait. When you get home, you wash your hands, but then you touch the bag, you carry your infected hands to get your lunch. That's true too. That's it's, there's no winning. There, yeah, you're right. I mean, don't. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> uh, still have the IMAX September. I did have a very good conversation though with a guy from BurgerFi. I don't know if everybody has BurgerFi, but BurgerFi is great. Um, 
So the Burger Fi guy and me were talking, and um, he is fastidious. I mean, he was complaining about when he goes to the supermarkets. That's what we were talking about. Because I, I said, did you go to the Publix lately? He's like, he's like, that's a disaster. I wouldn't even go there. Um, and he's talking about what they should do. So I like that because it made me confident in his place because he's like, he's like, when we do this, if you touch something with a glove, but then you then then you then you go to touch something else, you have to take the glove, you have to get a new glove. You can't just take the same glove and go from here to there. And he goes, that's he goes, that's important. If you don't change your gloves, then what's the point? And um, I was really happy about that, that he actually cares that much about it. And they're they're crazy. They're like wiping everything down every five minutes and stuff, but anyway. So that's but that's the point when you get that's why that one in 500 thing is important, because once you get more than one in 500 people having it, if you're in an, in a, in an urban area, it's the chance that you're not getting it is going to become very slim. Then it's like the common cold and it's like everybody's got the flu. You're going to just be lucky not to get it this season. Um, Robin said, still have the IMAX September uh, $20 calls. Should I just shoot myself? No, well, I mean, look, you should have rolled it a long time ago. But uh, our current IMAX position is where to go. What did we adjust it to? So we went to the September $10 calls and we have the $15 short puts. But oh no, you know what? This is this does not reflect the recent rolls that we did, because I think we actually went to December on it. But yeah, I mean, the $15 calls are probably pretty much worthless now. Um, you got the, the $20 calls. You know, what you want to do is just salvage the money from the 15s and roll back to the December 10s. That's basically all you can do right now. And Clay says, I get your point about what a company is worth. What about taking into consideration the company's future? Yeah, of course. But I'm saying all that is the fundamentals. You have to think about the demand and the ability to make money and how it's going to work and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, you know, yeah, you consider all those things. You consider the trends. You consider this and that. But you don't consider the freaking chart. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't tell you anything. That tells you where. That tells you how much money people were willing to pay for it yesterday, the day before, and the day before that. That's what it tells you. It doesn't tell you anything about the actual value of the company. Although. Although the 200-day moving average, to some extent, gives you an idea because you have to assume not everybody's an idiot, right? So when you look at the 200-day moving average, which is that line at 56 on iRobot, that probably is at least a bit realistic as far as like this 200 day, this is the last 200 days worth of people. There's a 200-day here at 55. That's realistic. That's probably in the ballpark of where the value really is. Only because you're, you're assuming that, that that everybody is not an idiot. That's what you're assuming. So if you look at IMAX, for example, the 200-day moving average is a 20. Okay, the 50-day can can re, can show you that currently there's a problem, or currently people are worried about the virus situation. But the 200-day moving average, as you can see, it's, it's really not that effective. And and that shows you a lot, a lot of people have been willing to pay $20 for IMAX, and you assume that not all of them are completely uh, ridiculous, uh, you know, complete morons. So probably ten is too low. That's that's the only useful thing in a chart is to be able to tell you something like that. Like, look, here's where pe here's what most people are willing to pay for IMAX in normal condition. So currently, when you can get it for ten, or when I can get it for six, I'm going to jump in there. First of all, because my upside's way higher than my downside. If I happen to be lucky and get it and it pops, I'm going to be in great shape. All right, so one last thing. We're going to take a look at the Fed and say um, FOMC meeting. Well, coronavirus Fed minutes. Let's just read the summary from CNBC. <laughs> Ah, stupid thing. I don't err. Uh, you know what you do to get around those ad block things? You open an incognito window. 
if you have a Chrome. Oh, what happened? Oh, that wasn't the article I opened. It was this one. Okay. Uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, members know the coronavirus outbreak has harmed communities, disrupted activity. Members judge the effects of the word weigh on economic activity. Decision included not to forward guidance. Fed uses future path. Uh, blah, 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 whatever it takes. Okay. Mester said in a statement she voted no because she wanted to give the Fed more flexibility. That doesn't make any sense. The central bank already had approved the emergency cut two weeks prior. The minutes indicated that Mester wanted a 50 point cut rather than 75. Oh, okay. Well, uh, she felt for, I, she wanted the I see. She wanted to be able to cut again, and she felt that that wasn't going to let them be able to cut again. In total, the minutes point to Fed doing taking a do whatever it takes approach to monetary policy. So in other words, the Fed is 100% backing you up. That's why the markets are now up 750 points on the Dow, almost 100 on the S&P, because the Fed is saying we will do whatever it freaking takes to back this thing up. We will fight this and we will do it. And also, I could see the Fed having that attitude because it's a short-term problem. They're not infinitely going to have to support the market. They shouldn't have to anyway. They have to support it for a couple of months and make a show of force and make sure people know you have their back. Why do they have to do that? They have to. The biggest problem is you can't have everybody getting laid off. You can't have uh, people losing their jobs and then people uh, defaulting on their mortgages and so on and so forth because that just sets off a cascade of failures. Um, you have to have some degree of normalcy for the time that we're locked in, which could be three months. So you have to bite it and pay for a quarter. That's what the Fed has to do. The Fed, and as much as they can, push the government to do it. They need to bite it and pay for a quarter. And don't forget who the Fed is. The Fed is a consortium of our banks. They don't, they're not the government. They are banks. They are a group of banks who are trying to, to, to work with the government to maintain the stable monetary system. That's their job. But their primary job is to make sure the banks don't get screwed. How do the banks get screwed? People can't pay their mortgages. People can't pay their rents. The commercial market goes crash. The housing market goes crash. And even if the banks foreclose on everybody, everything's worth half of what they thought it was. And it exceeds their ability to be bailed out. And then banks start going bust. And the FDIC goes bust because the FDIC doesn't have anything like the kind of money you think they have to back up. The thing. Wait, how much? Money does the FDIC have? <laughs> How much money does the FDIC really have? There you go. I knew somebody would. I knew somebody would care. What? Oh, come on! Just answer the question. Thirty billion? That's even worse than I thought. Thirty billion dollars the FBI is authorized to borrow from the Treasury. Thirty billion dollars. So they are insuring accounts up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So thirty billion million billion divided by two hundred and fifty thousand. One hundred and twenty thousand accounts. There you go. That's how much money the FDIC has. They can they can insure $120,000, $250,000 accounts in reality. What are they insuring? They're insuring every freaking account in America. It is a complete illusion. That's what the Fed has to protect. They have to protect the illusion that your money is backed by something. They have to protect the illusion that your money is safe in a bank. They don't have your money. They don't have the insurance on your money. They've already lent, they have already multiplied your money 10 times. You let, if you if you give the Fed $250,000, they can take $2.5 million and lend against it, backed by your $250,000. That's what they do. They take your money 
and they lend it out 10 times and leverage it all over the place. And then, but if they put that 2.5 million into a house for 2.5 million and the guy who had the house doesn't pay them and they try to sell the house and it's only 1.25 million instead of 2.5 million, then they lost 1.25 million dollars. The bank lost it on your 250. They need a bailout or you're screwed. That's how it works. And that's what and that's why as much as it makes you sick to do it, you have to bail out these banks and you have to bail out their 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 wretched excess. Because in good times it all works perfectly and they make boatloads of money, these banks, because they're making 10 times, even if they're lending at 3%, they're collecting 30% on your two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They're lending it out 10 times at 3%. And as long as everyone pays them back, everything's hunky-dory. They give you your 2% interest. They collect 30% interest. They make a margin of 27% for themselves. There's the occasional default, and they take a loss on that. But it's generally, you know, 1% or 2% of the total loan volume, so they're fine. They can take those hits. But if, but if those defaults climb and become a, a larger percentage of loan volume, they get it. They're screwed. Very, very quickly screwed. And that's what the system is, and that's why you. That's why what's happening now is is an incredible nightmare scenario, and they. And that's why you saw such quick action from the Fed and the government because if they allow this to go on, if they let people, def if they let people start losing their homes, stopping payment on apartments, not paying their autos, so on and so forth, within 90 days that kicks up to the banks, and the banks start having to write these loans off and take losses, and then spirals out of control really quickly. And that, that's more like what happened in 2008. And that's why the banks needed to be bailed out with TARP. So this time, they're trying to stop it from happening in the first place by bailing out the businesses, bailing out the people, and trying to keep the economy going because it's a short-term fix up. This is hopefully a short-term thing, not a long-term thing. But if it's a long-term thing, they'll just keep printing money. They can't afford the, now that they've gone down this path, they can't afford the alternative. Certainly not now that they've sunk all this money into it. Now they, they, they basically dug themselves a much deeper hole. All right, so like I said, I'm glad the market's up 700 points today. I'm glad we have a buffer into the weekend. It doesn't change my stance. We did our hedges. We're fine with that. I would rather take a small loss. I'd rather go from a million combined dollars to 900,000 combined dollars in our portfolios but at least we know we're on back on track and moving forward. That's all I care about, that we're going to survive this and move forward. We don't know that for sure yet, and this is going to be a very, very dangerous weekend because we're, we're going to have no information. Well, you have information, but I mean, we're not going to really see what happens for the next three days, and all of a sudden it's Easter and it's Passover and people are going to be distracted this weekend, but we're going to come back to Monday. You know it's going to be a shocking number. Okay, we went from um, 200,000 to 400,000 in seven days. That means next Wednesday, we'd be at 800,000. That means certainly, like I said, we're exactly what I predicted, 600,000 by Monday. And the question is, what side of 600,000 are we going to be on? If we're going to be over, then we're in big trouble. So it means we're accelerating faster. That means we're still doubling. And we can't afford to be doubling this deep into the virus. We can't afford one in 500 Americans to have the virus and we're still on a pace to double, which means that a week later, one in 250 will have the virus. And a week after that, one in 125. And a week after that, one in 60. One in 60 is 5 million people by the end of the month. We cannot be on that pace. So I'm telling you now that if we come back Monday and tomorrow is the last day to trade, if we come back Monday and the markets are ugly. Now, our hedges are cheaper now. They're cheaper now than they were yesterday. So take them if you don't have them. But if we come back Monday and we're, and we're way over six, then 
that's an accelerating problem. And I, I got to believe there are other people in the market besides me who understand that. And I don't care who says it's under control or who says happy days are here again and whatever crap they say. But if the number's there, nothing else matters. And it's not under control. And we will drill down and check it out then. But that's all I'm worried about. And until, until we get past that hurdle, I'm, I'm going to stay very well hedged. Like I said, I'm, I'd rather lose 10% of the port of the long-term, short-term combined portfolio. I'd rather lose 10% of it on my hedges than not have enough hedges because the, the, the cost of not having the hedges could be devastating. All right. On that happy note, everybody have as good of a possible holiday as you can. Happy Easter, happy Passover, happy everything else. And um, I don't know. Enjoy FaceTiming with your family, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you all next week. Thanks.